Good afternoon and welcome to Building Blocks Against Climate Change. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, my name is Jack Eit and I'm, I'm with uh, SoCal 350 Climate Action Coalition. We're an affiliate of 350.org and, and we're a coalition of over a hundred groups and countless individuals from SoCal who are fighting to solve the climate crisis, and I want to thank all of the people here from SoCal 350's coalition for coming out. Yeah. And we're also here to support what's happening in New York with the People's Climate Mobilization. Right now it's the largest climate mobilization to date. They're expecting over 100,000 people tomorrow, but I've heard up estimates upwards of, of 400,000. And beyond New York City, there's 2,000 different events like this one. We're part of a movement that is growing, and that is worldwide. So, so, and we need to make our voice louder. We need to, let's hear it, let's be loud. think of tar sands oil turning Canada's boreal forest into a sacrifice zone? How about pipeline spills like the one in Kalamazoo, Michigan? What do we think of industrializing the landscape uh, using dangerous techniques, extreme drilling techniques like fracking and acidization? Must we pollute our water and air just for a short-term fix of getting to work on time? No! What about the leaky and creaky oil trains that explode from time to time? No! Do we want them bringing tar sands and fracked oil and gas into Southern California, putting us all at risk? No! Well, SoCal 350 and our coalition of amazing groups, and we're going to hear from a, a number of them today, uh, are, are looking towards solutions uh, and, and working with government and, and trying to, to make positive change here. Um, so we've got solar, wind, advanced biofuels, public trans transit, green infrastructure, organic farming, uh, a vegan diet, supporting indigenous and frontline communities. Uh, all of this comes together to, to solve this climate crisis. So um, we have a number of speakers, as I mentioned, but uh, we're here here to hear from um, Paul, Council Member Paul Koretz from the City of Los Angeles. He's been an amazing leader on the City Council uh, and a friend to the earth, a true friend to the earth. And when you have a politician who stands up for the earth, I mean, this is a rare thing. I don't understand why. So we really need to support them. We need to lift them up. And, and, and make their voice louder. And that's what we're doing today. Uh, he's taken leadership roles such as climate change related issues, championing the city's groundbreaking feed and tariff solar program, uh, moving the city off coal power by 2025 and hopefully sooner, um, overhauling the city's commercial waste hauling system in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and aim for zero waste. Uh, closing down that leaking San Onofre uh, power plant, which was uh, still is a major risk, but at least it's shut down. Um, and he's a co-author of a motion calling for a moratorium on fracking in the city of Los Angeles. Let's hear about that. Councilman Koretz is also known for banning plastic bags, which the state is now following his leader. 
protecting honeybee populations, expanding the use of drought-tolerant native plants along the Expo line, phase two from 3% to 90%, we all need to, to, to follow that lead, and calling for a GMO-free growing zone in Los Angeles. So he represents the city as Mayor Garcetti's appointee to the Metropolitan Water District Board. So let's hear it for Councilman Paul Caretz. Well, that was awfully nice. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you're all here. This is great. It's especially great to see the kids that are here because what we're talking about is what kind of future we're going to leave for them in terms of uh, what shape the earth is in. Um, I thank you all for coming out today and doing everything you're doing uh, in terms of climate action. Thank you especially to our event organizers, the Converging Storms Action Network. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> We're here at the end, unfortunately it's cooled down. We're here at the end of one of the hottest weeks so far and one of the hottest years in California history. In fact, I believe this is the hottest year in recorded California history. Uh, Mexico's reeling from hurricane damage, Arizona's flooding, Northern California's on fire, and of course, uh, I hardly need to mention our historic drought here in Southern California. It's here, it's now, and Los Angeles is on the front lines. The Norwegian Refugee Council released findings this week that natural disasters displaced three times as many people as war last year. 22 million people forced from their homes by extreme weather. That's 22 million climate change refugees. Also in one of the most sickening things I've heard from Wall Street, through something called weather derivatives, investors are actually betting on and profiting from extreme weather events. In another called disaster capitalism, some economists are saying that we should sit back and let climate chaos happen because of all the money that could be made from the cleanup afterwards. Put it, profiting off the misery of others is, is obviously immoral, cynical, and just plain wrong. And purposely allowing that kind of misery to continue occurring is even worse. So I'm here today with some of the strongest climate action advocates in the country to say we're not going to let that happen. Yeah. Next Tuesday, the United Nations will host over 120 heads of state for a summit during which UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and I apologize if I mangled his name, um, hopes to catalyze worldwide action on climate change. We're here today standing in bi-coastal solidarity with the New York People's Climate March, telling the Secretary General, we're with you. The people of Los Angeles are with you. And I know I'm not alone in saying that those of us here today pledge to take part in this climate fight and make sure we get a handle on this issue and put a halt to the direction that things are going. Towards that end, a few weeks ago, I introduced a motion in the City Council calling for the City of Los Angeles to join New York, Chicago, Seattle, and other cities in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. I'm also, I'm also calling on the Department of Water and Power which has already been making amazing strides by moving off of coal power, which they've just about done, onto renewables, much greater en energy efficiency, to reduce their emissions by 80% by 2030. Yes. I've also just done a, a little video, which we just shot and cut, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll put on the internet, call, calling on elected officials across the country to film their own videos calling on their constituents to fight hard and support uh, President Obama in the effort to stop the Keystone Pipeline and stop cars. I think it's, 
It's an interesting grassroots approach, but hopefully if we can get support in the cities across the country this way, uh, maybe we can put a, fi a, a stop to something that, that looks like it's almost a done deal, but we can't let that happen. So whatever all of you can do, get the word out to everybody you can, and let's put a stop to this thing. Now, I don't want this just to be city government moving alone. I want the entire city to get involved. I want to engage synagogues and churches and mosques and neighborhood councils and homeowners associations and Silicon Beach and our business community and our schools and our film studios. We're all in this together. And I think if we all work together, we can get through this. What gives me hope is all of you and your dedication. And even animals are barking in agreement. So, with dogged determination, we can make this happen. Now, last spring, with a number of you that are here today, I co-hosted the launch of the Great March for Climate Action. Ed Fallon and a group of folks set out to walk every step of the way from Los Angeles to D.C. Um, I walked the first day. Not bad, but uh, they're walking from D.C. and they, they set a goal to reach there before the uh, November elections and uh, uh, fight this fight. One person that they talked to is at a time crossing the entire country and it looks like they're going to get to D.C. before November and they're going to make this point and I think that's amazing. We should all give them a big hand. <laughs> It's dedication like theirs and dedication like yours that is going to make this happen. Now Los Angeles, as I said, is on the front lines of a battle that spans the globe. This is truly the challenge of our generation. This is our World War III. And Los Angeles has to lead the way in this fight. It's up to us together, working hard, working fiercely, and I know we can do it. So I know you'll join me. I look forward to working together with you in the years ahead and we have to turn climate change around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Aura Vasquez from Sierra Club's My Generation campaign. Yeah. Hello. Can everybody hear me? All right, so hello, Los Angeles. I am Aura Vasquez. I'm here representing the Sierra Club. I'm also the vice president of the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council. So welcome to my neighborhood. I'm very excited to be here with all of you, shining the light to our environmental crisis. Today, I march together with all of you, hundreds of Sierra Club supporters, and Angelinos in solidarity with the New Year's People Climate March to call on the United Nations to take immediate climate action. Can we let the world know that climate change is here, is real, and is personal? Yeah. And it matters to you and to me. And at Sierra Club, we believe that Angelinos deserve a healthy environment with clean water and clean air, no matter where you live, what color you are, and what socioeconomical background you come from. Our legislators, have the duty to create policies to protect our health and our beautiful planet. So right now I'm really pleased to hear the news about the 8050 uh, resolution. We recognize also how dirty energy create policies that don't really work for us, that make people say, sick, restrain innovation, limit our job growth potential, and exacerbating climate change. Every day, Sierra Club, people like you and me, have organizers, activists, and supporters in the front lines to ensure that Angelinos, especially in communities of color, can receive the benefits of renewable energy and a clean environment. Sierra Club's members have worked diligently with the, the City of LA and the Department of Water and Power to bring different programs. I can testify of one of them, the Energy Efficiency Program, and just a month ago, I received a free refrigerator from the Department of Water and Power, and my whole building got retrofitted. So I, I encourage you all to also participate. And because Sierra Club knows how important and thriving econ uh, economy is for the environment, 
we've worked to bring Los Angeles the largest rooftop solar program in the country. So we should all be really proud of that. Bringing $500 million in economic development and creating over 500 jobs, good local jobs. That can be your neighbor, my cousins, your family. But our work can stop here because 5,000 people die a year from air quality related issues. We must, not, we must not stop fighting and demanding for clear standards that can protect our children from air pollution, like you know the current EPA standards on carbon and clean power plant. But when we must start locally, like Councilmember Corret stated, and at home here in LA. And for that today, I'm pleased to support Councilmember Corret's 80 by 50 motion and making sure that LA continues to lead on addressing the climate crisis. And, I'll, and I'm asking you all to also please sign the petition and support his efforts. Let your neighbors and friends and everybody you know know that the time to act on climate is now. So I want to leave you with three things today. Think globally and act locally. Support the 80 by 50 resolution as your neighborhood council, your neighbors, your family to write a letter on support. Urge the environmental agency for a strong rule on carbon. We cannot afford to have any more children sick in LA. And we can be an example of accepting this reduced carbon pollution and lead for job creation. Call on the United Nations to make immediate climate action. And don't forget, hashtag people's climate. We are part of a large mobilization of people around the earth. Not only calling for action, but taking action. Thank you. Thank you, Aura. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Quasi and Kruma from the Martin Luther King Coalition of Greater Los Angeles. Hi, well thank you, and thank you for being out here with us today. You know, a lot of movements start with very small groups of people. And by small, I mean, you know, sometimes a room with two or three people in it. Well, we're a lot more than just two or three people. But we're still in trouble. Because our planet, <coughs> our planet is on, on the verge of collapse. You know, and we can point a, point a lot of fingers, and, and in some cases we really should, but the problem is all of our problems because it's really our way of life which is causing this crisis. It's the way that we live. It is the way that we produce. It is the way that we treat our natural resources as if they will be here forever and we can just expend them in any kind of way that we want. That is what has gotten us into the jam that we're in now and we're late in responding to it. We're very, very late. Our culture is what is keeping most of, of the people uh, here in Southern California who are frying in this heat from being out here with us. We have so many toys to play with that we are not putting our minds on survival. We're not putting our minds on, on our responsibility to the world that we live in. And that must change. We have very few people like Mr. Koretz, and I told him this down at the march at the uh, the launch of, of the Great March. We have too few people like Mr. Koretz who are in public office who really will go to bat on these issues. We have to make it possible and we have to make it necessary for all of them to get serious about this. And as he said, this is like a war. This is World War III. I mean, FDR said, look, you know, World War II is here. We have to completely re-gear re everything to deal with it, to handle this crisis. And they did. In the early 60s, JFK jumped up and said, well, the Russians have put Sputnik into space and we're in a Cold War. So we have to gear up everything uh, to deal with the space race. And they did. Well, where is the race for energy conversion? Where is, is the, the race to develop solar power? We have to. 
We have to create the conditions that that becomes a priority, and that is why hundreds of thousands of people are going to descend on New York on Sunday, tomorrow, to tell our world leaders that they better catch up with this problem. But hey, we better catch up with this problem too. Seriously, you know, we've got to talk to our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers and say, look, get serious about this and come out with me. We need to make a habit of making uh, witness, whether it's here on the Wilshire Boulevard or some other main boulevard in this town periodically as this crisis continues to escalate, and it will. By next year, this might seem like cool weather to us. And I'm not joking, and it's not funny. So we better get serious about changing some of our habits and, and, and getting some of the people we know to change theirs and to put their toys down long enough to take the responsibility to make sure that we still have a planet to live in next year and the year after that and the generation after this and hopefully you know many generations afterward but right now it is a question mark and we are the answer thank you Thank you, Quasi and Kruma. Uh, next, we're going to hear from an amazing woman who, who sort of started this whole, this whole process, this building blocks against climate change. It's Lisa Lubo from the Con Converging Storms Action Network. I should be applauding all of you. This idea to bring you all together on the streets of Wilshire has taken off. I knew that this was not an environmental justice issue. This was a human issue. We are in the 11th hour. When it comes to talking about weather, when it comes to talking about fossil fuels, when it comes to talking about 7.2 billion people surviving on this earth, with constricting resources and a biosphere that is in jeopardy, it is clearly obvious that we need to do something different. In New York City, if you look at the list of organizations that are turning out for the People's Climate March, we aren't just environmentalists anymore. We've got labor. We've got the elderly. We've got the people that are fighting against the criminalization of poverty. We've got people that are fighting for jobs and survival. We've got a whole range of people. So, I came up with an idea. I picked Wilshire Boulevard because it was in the middle and I invited people to pick a block, to pick a corner and to come out. Have you looked at the list on the website? We have everything from Occupy Pasadena to the League of Women Voters. We have the San Fernando Gray Panthers. And, <laughs> yes, and we have the San Gabriel Neighbors for Peace and Justice. We have large organizations, nonprofits that have funding and large mailing lists, and we have small groups that have stood on the corners for years and talked to people. And it was our experience in the vigil movement here in L.A. in 140 different communities that urged me to get everybody out of their comfort zone, talking to people on the street and talking to one another. That's what we're doing here. Look around. I looked around and picked up a sign over there that that woman has that she made by hand. We have the power to alter climate change. Yeah. People do not understand that there are those at the top who control money and decision making. But they accomplish nothing without our going along with it. If we don't vote for them, they have no office. If we don't buy from them, they have no profits. If we don't work for them, they have no products. And if, and if we don't remain silent and complicit, they can't get away with putting profits over people, over planet. And like I said, we're in the 11th hour. It's up to us. This needs to be a mobilization of a movement that not only brings together a wide variety of organizations and a wide variety of people, but also a wide variety of political positions. We need to understand that you don't bully away the people that disagree with you. You figure out where you agree, you work together, and where you don't agree, you keep talking. This today in building blocks against climate change, it's a little demonstration. 
But when you look at the selection of people that are side by side on the street today, the people who made their own signs or came up with t-shirts or decided what they wanted to do on their part of it, and then linking up together in something like this press conference with a city councilman that has a resolution that could put Los Angeles ahead of the rest of the country in setting an example of the kind of policies that need to happen, as well as large numbers of people on the street that range from people that say, I don't want fracking in my neighborhood poisoning my children, to people who say what we need is system change in order to actually save this planet. We have a range of positions here. And we need to figure out how to create strategic alliances that leverage power that say there's more of us than there are of you. This is our planet. This is our future. This is our home. So I think everybody needs to ask themselves and ask everybody they know, what does climate change really mean to me? What does it mean to the things I care about, the people I care about, the causes I'm fighting for? What does it mean about the future I envision? Do you understand? It's not just about hot weather. It's not just about not enough water. We're talking about the price of food going up and food riots everywhere because people are going to be starving because there's not enough, because our climate is no longer going to be able to sustain that. And in every arena in terms of resources, when you have a bias fear that is challenged, that is in jeopardy, that is what I call wobbling, weather wobble, when you reach that point, it cannot sustain life. The species are dying out in massive amounts in unprecedented uh, era of species extinction. The pollution is having effects on the physiology of life in ways that it has never had before. All of it driven by the incredible amount of fossil fuel that has been taken out of the ground in the last hundred years and poured into our atmosphere. Mm. So I not only, good boo, good boo. <laughs> so I now urge all of you to not only get active, to not only question what this means to you, to connect your own concerns to this larger picture of climate change, to not only figure out how you can create strategic alliances, working together with people, with it, with embracing the differences, because the differences are really our resources. They're what make our, us have a rich, diverse approach to yes. tackling this, so that we tackle it at city council, and we tackle it in Congress, we tackle it at the UN, and we tackle it in the streets. But in addition, I urge everybody to start reading. Don't put your hand, head under the sand because there's a whole lot more sand coming. You know, you might end up being buried under there. Study it. Learn about it. So that when you talk to people, you're grounded in the science of what is really going on in this world. I thank you all for coming out. I thank you for doing this. And the most important thing that I see here is the initiative that comes from the bottom up. I love the fact that our councilman is putting forward and asserting himself for the kind of resolution before the LA City Council. Yes. But we all know that none of it will work without all of you, yes. without all of us. Yes. So take confidence, take initiative. Start working, start talking, start reading, start organizing, start linking up with other people. Because what happened here today with building box, blocks against climate change, it's a little demonstration. But it also could be a, a lesson, a learning moment in building a mass movement that's unprecedented in anything this world has seen. And that's what we need. It is the only thing that will save this planet. So thank you all for the role you're going to and are playing in it. Thank you, Lisa LeBeau. Uh, next, we're going to hear from a high school student and a fellow from the Alliance for Climate Education, Diego Zapata. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Diego Zapata, and I'm a senior at Bravo High and a Climate Action Fellow with the Alliance for Climate Education. I am a child of nature and of the city. A call to the wild as I buzz along the bullion streets of LA. I am of the strong as much as the weak, of the privileged and of the poor. I see myself in every facet of my environment, 
in the wings of effervescent butterflies, in the litter-saturated sidewalks, in the mellifluous symphony of the trees, and in the jarring cacophony of the urban. I am a descendant of both juxtaposed worlds, and I cannot live without both. But when I am witness to the impotence of sagebrushes and hundred-year-old oak trees as they slowly take heed to the garnering strength of skyscrapers and the cement shackles of humanity's superiority that has left the LA River to be an enigma of its once vivacious past, there is no question to my motives. I seek a balance between my worlds, harmony, peace. I believe that we can live contingently in these worlds without imposing on the other. Is this notion so wrong? In a world that is continuously plagued by a sporadically changing environment, there is no doubt whether the environment is a key priority to secure a tolerable future. Deforestation, ozone depletion, pollution of oceans, a deleterious agricultural system, the destruction of entire ecosystems. None of these are the most difficult challenges we face. The most arduous challenge we face today as a people is having to change an impetuous mercenary world culture that does not take into account the well-being of the environment in each decision we make. It is the tragedy of the commons. We have to convince the world to sympathize with nature. We must incline them to abjure a fallacious sense of self-obsession. We must make them realize their intrinsic but latent connection with the natural so that they may realize the erroneous path of greed they follow. Although this may seem idealistic in retrospect, there is little else we can do but hope that humanity realizes this benevolent epiphany. Otherwise, what hope will there be when our children are forced to live a life of urban decay simply because we are too caught up in our individual lives to see the iniquities of our everyday lives? I think that it is the youth of each nascent generation who owes it to the world to make a difference in the world. Younger folk are a unique people who have an eye for injustice when others are too focused in their lives to feel even an urge to give it a second thought. The youth are products of two factors, of their own infinite symbol communities and of a grander ubiquitously assimilated world culture that allows them to weigh their own intrinsic principles with the values of a modern world. And with both of these in consideration, a young mind can become a catalyst for change. There's also no doubt that young minds are also endowed with innate insolence. When older minds are so gradually inclined to conformity, each new generation challenges the archaic institutions in need of reform. This is why such a youth-oriented community like ours is, is such a key facet of a perpetually changing world. We can each take note of this world, weigh its morals and ethics with our own, and can use our innate insolence to act on it. So please, youth of this generation, join the crusade for a greener future. We need it badly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diego Zapata. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Ella Tabaski from the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council. Hello, Angelinos. How y'all doing? Yeah. Thanks for coming out tonight. As you all know, this week, world leaders are going to gather in New York City for a crucial climate summit in the United Nations. NRDC and the world will be watching closely. And we're speaking out today because this is a critical time. Climate change is no longer a far off peril. It is here and now. From rising seas to widespread droughts, wildfires, floods, and famine, climate change is taking a growing and grievous toll on our families, our communities, and economies. Here in California, the effects of climate change are all around us, and our most vulnerable residents will be the most disproportionately impacted. The U.S. is the second largest carbon polluting country, and we've begun to show leadership on this issue with improved vehicle fuel efficiency standards that will save money and clean up the air, and the first ever limits on dangerous carbon pollution from our largest source, power plants. But this is not enough. Our leaders need to hear loud and clear that the, that the time for take, talking about climate change has passed and it's time to get real about implementing the solutions we need to solve this crisis. So today, NRDC stands in solidarity with all of you, with the marchers across the country and the world, calling for leaders to commit to bold action at the Climate Summit. We thank Councilmember Kuretz for joining us today and for his continued leadership on this issue. We are here together because we know that climate change is everything, and we need everyone. With all of you here today, we know this opportunity is within our reach, but we're going to have to fight for it. Now is the time to build a better world with cleaner air, stronger, healthier communities, and more economic prosperity, and I know we can do it with all of you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ella from NRDC. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Les McCabe from Global Green. Thank you. I have a quick story to tell you. My comments will be brief. Yesterday, yesterday I flew back from Zurich, Switzerland, where I attended the board meeting for Green Cross International, our affiliate organization, and had the opportunity to meet with our founder, Mikhail Gorbachev. I was sitting next to him at lunch, watching a man who 20 years ago had a vision to eliminate weapons of mass destruction, to eliminate chemical weapons, but most importantly to fight and combat climate change. And I thought to myself, at 83 years old, what does the former president of the Soviet Union know that leaders in our own country don't know or don't get? The passion behind his vision for a clean future, for a healthy climate, for renewable energy was striking to me. Nine years ago, last month, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast with devastating effects, followed by Hurricane Sandy with devastating effects. Global Green worked very hard to restore housing and wetlands in New Orleans and Louisiana and to create renewable energy through our Solar for Sandy program for residents in New Jersey. We led the push for the largest solar incentive program in the country, and we led the effort to start the largest private sector green building program as well. But friends, our work and your work will mean nothing if we don't do something about climate change. It's time to take our climate back. It's time to work with Mother Nature, not against her. Thank you, Councilman Koretz, for your leadership on Los Angeles, which represents an opportunity to serve as a model for urban areas throughout the United States. Global Green USA stands with you and all of our colleagues in the environmental movement and the fight for climate change. Thank you. Mr. Koretz, uh I know you mentioned it in uh, in your speech, but I'm wondering what you think about the fact that uh, Northern California is burning up right now, and uh, if that's happening in Northern California, what LA might be in for? Well, it's there. There's so many events of, of extreme climate change that we're seeing that every time I speak on the subject there are five things that have happened in the last week or two that are disasters that we would have never believed and they're happening everywhere. Um, we, we see what's happening in Northern California but we have a drought that may go on for, for a number of years here in Los Angeles um, and, and we have uh, not enough water in storage so we could be in, in great long-term trouble here and that's just the absolute absolute tip of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we have to get a handle on this because I, I don't believe the tipping point is very far away. If, if we keep producing uh, exponentially the greenhouse gases, um, this planet is not going to be uh, uh, able to sustain human life in, in X number of years, 50 years, 100 years. So we have to take every possible action we can now. Well, we're in the time of the worst drought, we're continuing fracking in California and we're, we're destroying permanently millions and millions of gallons of water. Um, I, I wouldn't be unhappy if years from now after fracking has been eliminated for a long period of time, if we try certain technologies to see if we can clean up the damage that's already been done, which at best I would think would take many decades. We certainly can't keep adding to it by continuing fracking and destroying more and more millions of gallons of water you know, across the country. Country, uh, endangering ourselves by causing earthquakes and a number of other dangers that fracking brings. Okay, thank you very much. This is the petition to support Paul Corrette's motion to reduce our climate changing emissions by 80%. Sign it. So, uh, I'm speaking to Kent Minault, who's uh, one of the main organizers with LA Beyond Coal, and uh, I'm just wondering how you feel about uh, natural gas because uh, California is almost off coal, but we've pivoted to uh, natural gas. There's tons of natural gas plants, and the, the fracking issue is really destroying a lot of our water during this, uh, well, system, new system normal uh, drought condition. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, you certainly hit on the, the sore point because um, that, that's right. If you look at the uh, current version of the LADWP's IRP, it shows, I think, 47% of the projected capacity in natural gas which is a terrible idea because it not only uh, feeds into the fracking boom 
that's destroying lots of different parts of the country, but also it uh, locks us, if, if implemented, it will lock us into long-term contracts uh, for gas. Uh, and although gas has become cheaper with the fracking boom, that's not going to go on forever. In fact, we're already seeing an upswing in the price of natural gas. So the real way to save people money on their utility bills is to go for renewable energy because everywhere in the world renewable energy is deployed in large amounts, you see a steep drop in the wholesale price of electricity and that's what we want to see here. We want to see uh, homeowners and businesses saving money on their bills by adopting renewable energy and energy efficiency measures rather than locking us into long-term contracts for natural gas. So there's a financial as well as an environmental reason for looking for every possible way we can not to have a natural gas future but to have a renewable energy future. Would you be in favor of uh, <clears throat> the Los Angeles uh, in, in, uh, in tandem with its uh, municipal water recycling and treatment plant um, creating a biodiesel generation from uh, algae growth off of human waste. Yeah, I think generally that's a good idea. Um, the, the, uh, what you want to do is make sure the biodiesel doesn't come from resources that uh, could be used for food. Right. But if we're getting it from sewage gas and algae, then we're not bringing it uh, in from food. And although biodiesel, when burned, will release carbon into the atmosphere, that's basically carbon that was already in the atmosphere last year, as opposed to fossil fuels where you're releasing carbon that's been sequestered for millions of years. So yeah, I think that's a good idea. A anything that we can do to to keep the water here and to limit the amount of water we bring in from outside also reduces energy consumption because a huge amount of energy is used to pump the water over the mountains. And so it saves us on our electricity bills as well as basically being good for our, for our water economy. So uh, I I was impressed by what you were saying at the uh, at the rally over there. You were talking about the fact that uh, tell me what the 51 percent on your shirt means. 51 percent is a number that was uh, in a UN report, the Goodman and Anyang report that came out in 2009 that said 51 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions comes from animal livestock, uh, animal agriculture and livestock. That's bigger than all the trucks, cars and factories in the world combined. And it's pretty much an ignored number. So we talk about fracking, we talk about plastic bottles, we talk about oil, but none of those added up combined add up to the same number that grass-fed animals have, ruminants, for example. I was uh, <coughs> watching a film called uh, Six Degrees, and in that film, somebody calculated the uh, carbon footprint of a cheeseburger, or more accurately, all the cheeseburgers in the United States in it consumed in a year. It was something like 250 billion tons of carbon. Yeah, it's it's astronomical. I mean, there there are there are numbers and numbers. Um, one gallon of milk, for example, takes roughly 27 showers. That's a month's worth of showers, water combined for one gallon of milk. Um, and 80 percent of the anima, 80 percent of the Amazon rainforest has been destroyed to make way to grow food for animal industrialized agriculture. So we're looking at huge, a huge impact across all, you know, water, uh, Amazon, the land, the toxins, the climate change, and all down to the diet on your plate. And we think that this is something that has been ignored for too long and been in denial for too long. So, and you know, it's, it's now the facts are irrefutable and can no longer be denied. And it's such a simple thing. I know people think it's very difficult, but it's actually quite a simple thing and something we're all empowered to do ourselves is to change our diet so it's all very well to be like pointing fingers at the fossil fuel industry and we hardly have an impact on them as a you know an individual you can barely have an impact on them but you can have an impact on animal agriculture by going vegan Absolutely. how long have you been a vegan uh, four years and I was vegetarian since I was 13 and I've been an activist since I was 16 so. and I've been 
vegetarian. I, th I was vegetarian first. I think I was vegetarian for about 20 years, and I've been vegan for over 10 years. And you don't experience any uh, limitations in terms of your, your energy or your strength? Absolutely not. I get to eat eggs, milk and meat. There's a plethora of meat, alternative meat products that don't come from an animal. There's a plethora of different uh, uh, milks, almond milk, rice milk, hemp milk, soy milk don't come from an animal. There are cheeses that don't come from animals. So you're not missing out on anything. We have, I, I've found that as a vegan, we're extremely in love with food and we don't deprive ourselves of anything. Do I look like a size 2 to you? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I'm a very healthy girl. And I think there's a lot, you know, a lot of people say, have this attitude that a vegan diet is depriving yourselves of something and how do you keep yourself healthy? But I have to question like, okay, so what's healthy about a meat-eating diet? You know, it's full of toxins, it's full of antibiotics. I'd like to bring Lisa in actually. She's a spokesperson for PCRM, if you don't mind. Would that be okay? Oh, well, sure, of course. This is Lisa Carlin. She speaks for Hi, Hi I'm you? Lisa Carlin. I'm a Food for Life instructor with Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So we're talking about the health value of a plant-based diet, a vegan diet. Right. So we know that chronic disease, which is what something that plagues everybody regardless of what country we live in. We know now that um, undernutrition or malnutrition in China and India have now been replaced with overnutrition with the um, importing of our fast food industry. And now we see many of the same diseases that plague people in the United States in countries that were known for malnutrition, such as China and India. So now we know that American medicine does a great job of dealing with trauma. It does a great job of dealing with if you're having a heart attack and to save you from a heart attack. But really where we have to focus on is prevention. And those people that focus on prevention in terms of the dietary choices will have less cardiovascular disease, which by the way kills 50% of our population, less cancer, less autoimmune disease, and now we know that people that consume a plant-based diet that's low in fat also have less Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. So there is no question that we can be much healthier consuming plants. Watch that. So if you keep your fats low and you eat plants, so we say right. go vegan for your health, for the animals, and for the planet. Very good. Thank you. Go vegan. Go vegan. All right. Thank you. My name is Dylan Gasparic, and you can use my image for anything. Okay. Um, so, uh, what brought you out today? Well, I'm, uh, I was invited by the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and I, as a citizen of the, uh, as, of the world and a concerned, uh, 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 concerned, uh, citizen, I came out to, to show my support for the climate action in New York, uh, around the UN Climate Summit that's happening this week. If, uh, if some Northern bad California, audio right if now. Northern California is burning up from wildfires, what do you think is going to happen to Los Angeles if we don't do something about climate change? Yeah, Los Angeles is in a, a unique climate where uh, warming, uh, warming climate is really going to affect us uh, probably really negatively. Mm -hmm. um, we have a limited water supply. We have a, a, a temperate climate now, which could become um, hotter and more of a desert, desert climate. And uh, we, have, we have a lot of unique challenges. We also have a, a low-lying coastline that could be inundated by storm surges um, like we've never seen before. What do you think about the idea of uh, pivoting to natural gas as a solution to climate change when methane, the leakage of over 3% is like 100 times worse than CO2? You know, uh, natural gas is just another fossil fuel. It's just, uh, it's, it's more of the same essentially. Uh, it, you have to pollute the water and air to get it out of the ground and, uh, and, and it contributes, it's a greenhouse gas as well. You know, we need to be thinking about more of the 21st century solutions like solar, wind, geothermal, and, uh, and, and moving away from uh, burning stuff to get our en energy. You think it's a bad idea to be using our scarce water resources to go after natural gas during a uh, century long drought? Yeah, water should be for growing food and and uh, and hydrating ourselves, not for uh, as an industrial byproduct to get um, fossil fuels out of the ground to uh, uh, 
contribute to, to dig us deeper into this hole that we're in. You know, water is for drinking and for and for growing food. Great, thank you. You're welcome. How how do you feel about what went on today? It's like really awesome that we're like out here, you know, representing what's going to be going on tomorrow in New York. So I think it was good to have a little LA love out here too. Um, how confident are you that uh, our uh, elected leaders will uh, do anything about this issue unless the people come out in force to uh, give, oh. them a, <laughs> give them a push. Yeah, I definitely feel like unless we involve some people power, nothing's going to change because, you know, big corporations are already teaming up together like Shell and Lego to like go help and fund the drilling in the Arctic. You know, of course we need some people to stand up and say, hey, like you're killing our planet, this isn't okay. Okay, so, um, okay, I see your shirts say uh, Occupy Pasadena. Occupy Democracy Pasadena. Occupy Democracy Pasadena. And democracy only works when you participate. Actually, exactly. It only works when you practice it, I think, is the deal, isn't it? Well, it, to us it feels like one of, one of the problems is that people don't even bother, pre when, if you don't, you don't get involved and find out what it's like, how can you practice it? So we encourage people to start their participation, uh -huh. and when they do that, then they can actually understand just what a vibrant, uh, fun, and rewarding kind of thing it can be. Are you familiar with the uh, thing that happened in Boulder, Colorado, where the uh, people in the city got together and they kept trying to move their their privately owned electrical utility to a greener energy, and they they were slow in coming around. So they actually they actually got together and uh, put it to a to a vote to the city to take over the utility. I, I, I had not heard of that, but I've heard of similar cases like that, where people are trying to take control of their communities and, and the way the way things are done. So you know, and it's going to happen. I mean, with with renewable energies, it's it's decentralized. People are going to have power, you know, over their power. So yeah, people literally are going to you know when you know back in 2000 uh, was it 2003 was Howard Dean was our was. Our inspiration, right, and one right. of the things that he said at the end of his campaign, uh, you know, was, uh, "You have the power," and that is a literal example of people taking control of, of, of you know, showing their power and getting the power that they need. I mean, the decentralized power is is, is going to be the way that things are going to go eventually. Yeah, we're we're one step ahead here with DWP, but as as. Uh Councilman Corrette said earlier, LA is really on the firing line. I mean, if if uh, Northern California is burning up due to forest fire, what do you think is going to happen to Los Angeles if we don't get a handle on climate change? It's it's either going to go underwater or burn up. <laughs> or both. Well, you know, actually, uh, Southern California is is a lot further along when it comes to water conservation than Northern California, and that's because we've had to by necessity. Um, it. In some ways, we're ahead of Northern California at doing the things we need to do. I think our, the biggest elephant in the room is really how do we deal with uh, people with their green lawns and uh, and then the way we do our farming. Our farming is is big agribusiness, you know, in Fres up in Fresno and in, in uh, the San Joaquin Valley. We need to change the way we do farming so that it also is decentralized. And you know, I, this my friend Dan's a, he's a farmer, family farm, and. It's a local farm, and they, 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 that's how we need to do our work, you know. And, you know, we, we as a small farmer don't have to answer to you know, big corporations, so, you know, we can make choices the way that we, you know, irrigate our crops or, you know, the, the cultural activities that we do to, to grow our crops. So, you know, more, more family farms, less big corporate ag, and, and more honking. Um, <laughs> right. Well, LA's got those three uh, three issues: food, water, and energy. Yeah. And uh, 
if we can get, we're almost off coal, but we've, been, we've pivoted to natural gas. We have a lot of natural well, you gas know, plants. Natural right gas is, uh, people don't understand that it too is actually a very big global warming producer, simply by the fact that the distribution system uh, leaks everywhere. Uh, I mean, it's, this isn't just some kind of paranoia thing. It, the natural gas is not as clean as we might think it, it can be, and, and so we need to find ways to conserve energy, uh, use solar and other other forms of renewables, and 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 we need to find ways to get away from this capitalist culture, uh, economic system uh, that encourages profit over people and encourages consumption over finding other ways of, of really filling that void that people seem to have. With a, we don't need to buy our way to happiness. Happiness can be found other ways. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Climate change now. Why don't we hear? Uh, 